Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. This is not John the Apostle, but John Mark, uh, Mark the author of the Gospel of Mark. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, talking about Bar-Jesus, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Hey, For those who don't know, this book of Acts uh, was written by Luke, the same Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke. And really, as we look at it, it's, it's kind of a sequel to Luke's Gospel because it deals with what happens immediately following Jesus' ascension. That's why its full name is called the Acts of the Apostles. So we can, we can think of this as kind of the Gospel of Luke, part two. Here we have a recently, in this chapter, we have a recently converted Saul, who after this chapter in the book of Acts will be pretty much exclusively referred to by his Roman name, Paul, and Barnabas, another apostle, being sent by the Holy Ghost on a mission trip. They're prayed over by the church at Antioch, which was the... Uh, center of the faith at, at that time. Uh, it's in modern day Turkey now. They sailed for this island called Cyprus, which is just southeast of there. They land on the western edge of the island, Seleucia, and then travel eastward overland to this place called Paphos, which is uh, today called uh, Kalukia. Now, Paphos at that time was a major religious site for the island of Cyprus and for the whole rest of that Mediterranean region. I wish I had a map that I could show you. It was the home to a sanctuary devoted to the Greek goddess Aphrodite, which was called Venus by the Romans, who was a goddess of love and fertility who, who it was said that she had been born in the ocean just off that town. Now in these times, being religious wasn't the same thing as being moral. If you worshipped in Aphrodite's temple, generally that involved getting drunk and hanging out with prostitutes, and I won't go any farther. But it gives you an idea of the atmosphere of the city that the Holy Ghost calls Saul and Barnabas into. Wasn't exactly Las Vegas. That would have been Corinth, the city of Corinth at that time. This was kind of like Atlantic City, New Jersey. Like not quite Sin City, but almost there, you know? So when they get there, they come across this Jewish sorcerer named Bar-Jesus, which is interpreted as, as son of Jesus or son of Joshua. His father was probably named Joshua. But in the local tongue, he had another name, Elymas, which stands for magician or sorcerer. Although sorcery and, and magic, black magic, was forbidden by the Jews, some, some people did it anyway. They were kind of like... Uh, Mercenaries. It was noise throughout the whole region that Jewish, if you wanted a sorcerer, a Jewish sorcerer was your best bet. They were renowned for some reason for their abilities. 
And, and it made them an outcast to their own people, but man, it was a lucrative job if you got in with the right people. So here we have this Bar-Jesus or Elymas working for a uh, Roman proconsul named Sergius Paulus. Uh, the King James Version here calls him a deputy, but we can think of him as kind of like the lieutenant governor of the island. He wasn't the man in charge, but he was, he was second in command. So he had this sorcerer working for him, likely so he could get the Jewish perspective on the issues facing them at the time. Um, so as Paul and uh, Saul and, and Barnabas come to preach the word of God on Cyprus, this man, Sergius Paulus, which Luke records here, a prudent man, a smart man, he asks to hear the word of God. And Elymas tries to discourage that interest probably because it would have undermined his own cash flow. Uh, and then we see Saul, filled with the Holy Ghost, rebuke this sorcerer and, and causes him to become blind for a season. And because of that, Sergius believes on Jesus. Now this temporary blinding of Bar-Jesus or Elymas is regarded as the first recorded miracle done by the Apostle Paul. But I would contend that it's the second most important miracle in this passage of Scripture. I want you to look at verse 7. Which was, we're talking about Bar-Jesus here, Bar-Jesus which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, a smart man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Here we have a Roman official a Roman lieutenant governor, a man of intelligence, a man living in a town full of sin and debauchery, a servant of an empire whose borders stretched almost the whole world round, who on their money printed pictures of Caesar with the inscription, the Son of God. This man asks to hear the Word of God. Asks to hear the Gospel, which at this point was still a fledgling religion regarded by some as a Jewish cult, a, a group of people filled with nobody but outcasts, outsiders, and misfits, unwelcome in their own country, rejected by their own people, but here we have a powerful Roman official asking to hear the Word of God. What would cause somebody like that to be interested in the gospel? We see it right in verse 2. It says, The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas, and Saul for the work whereunto I have called thee. It shows up again in verse 4. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. It shows up again in verse 9. Saul filled with the Holy Ghost. Again and again and again, throughout the entire book of Acts, and especially this chapter, we see the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God, going before people, preparing the way, preparing men's hearts, on, so that when the preachers arrive, all they have to do is speak the word, and, and they get to harvest the fruit that the, that the Holy Ghost has already prepared the soil for and planted the seed for. From beginning to end, Luke's sequel here, the book of Acts, is basically the story of the Holy Ghost. That's why some people don't call this the Acts of the Apostles. Some people call it the Acts of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, time and time again, prepares the way in the book of Acts. I want you to consider the story of Philip and the eunuch that we taught about a couple weeks ago in Acts chapter 8. You don't have to turn there. But it says, The angel of the Lord said unto Philip, Arise, go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. He rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Yes, it was the Spirit that told Philip to go preach to this eunuch. But something had already happened, we know, in this man's life if he was sitting in that chariot reading the book of Isaiah. And we see a few verses down that he, he was curious about what the prophet Isaiah had to talk about. 
The Holy Spirit had prepared the way so that when yes, Philip finally showed up, all he had to do was put a ribbon on the package. Amen. The same thing happens in the 16th chapter of this book of Acts with a woman named Lydia. Paul was heading to Macedonia having received a vision that he should go there and preach. And Luke writes in verses 13 and 14, On the Sabbath day we, because Luke was on the trip with him, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. She believes, then we read, and she is baptized along with the rest of her house. The Spirit of God had gone before the preacher, <laughs> gesturing a little too wildly here, had gone before the preachers, had prepared the hearts of the people who were going to hear the message so that when they showed up, all they had to do was present the gospel of Jesus right. and the work was complete. You're right, Jeff. Now, when I was a young believer, nothing scared me more than the idea of witnessing to people. I don't know if, if it's evident, but I have, my, as long as I can remember, have suffered from this social anxiety. When I was a young reporter at the newspaper, it would literally sometimes take me an hour to work up the courage to call somebody on the phone. It's, it's just very intimidating. To, you don't know if they're going to yell at you or hang up on you. It's just... So this idea, and it was even worse when I was a young teenager, this idea that I was, I had this idea in my head, it wasn't, as far as I know, nobody told me this, but I had this idea that I needed to make every conversation I had with anybody about their need for Jesus. Is that me? Somebody's car is honking. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Sounds like it's. Yeah, it's not me. All right. Um, devil will work on a car horn, won't he? I, I had this idea that every conversation I had had to be about how the person I was talking to needed Jesus, and if they didn't accept him right now, they were going to hell. And that. But I couldn't have those conversations with people. I was too anxious and too nervous and, and, and too full of self-doubt to have those kind of conversations. So I walked around constantly feeling terrible about my inability to witness for God the way I wanted to because I did. I wanted to tell people about Jesus. I, I just didn't know how to go about it. Here's what I didn't appreciate at that time. Evangelism is not supposed to be, and when we say evangelism, this is not just preachers. This is every believer has the responsibility to tell other people about Jesus. But evangelism is not just a shotgun where we you know, produce a big spray and hope we hit something. The gospel is a scalpel that cuts into the deepest parts of our hearts and souls. And I've got good news. We're not the ones holding the knife. When we tell people about Jesus, when we tell people about the gospel, just like the apostles in the book of Acts, we must do it in partnership with the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. This is what I did not appreciate when I was a young believer. I thought I was out there doing it myself. We must pray that the Spirit will do its work first so that when it's our turn to speak, the ground has already been tilled. The seeds have already been sown. All we have to do is reach down and harvest the fruit. Amen. Where she's at? A friend of mine recently told me about an experience she'd had. She'd wanted for a long time to talk to her brother about Jesus. And as any of you know, your family and close friends are the hardest people oh, oh yeah. to witness to. You're right. But then they're going somewhere recently and they're in the car and, and they're talking and just out of nowhere, seemingly, he says, so what does it mean that Jesus died for your sins? And she got to explain salvation to her brother. She didn't have to hit him over the head with it. No. She didn't have to 
wedge her way in. Because the Holy Spirit, because she had prayed that this opportunity on, would arise, son. the Holy Spirit right. had prepared the ground, yes. had sown the seeds, and then when harvest time was there, she was able to come in and do her part. The Holy Spirit had prepared the way. I had a very similar experience to this recently. And it was unlike anything I have ever experienced in my life. It was, it was, it was just like... It was like the Holy Spirit just slapped me in, in the side of the face. One of my best friends in the world is an atheist. And he's not just an atheist. He's what I call an evangelical atheist. Like, he doesn't believe in God, and he doesn't believe anyone else should believe in God either. He's constantly putting stuff on Facebook about how dumb religious people are and, and how silly this whole thing is. Even though he knows I'm a devout, devout Christian, and, and I think he regards, I know he regards me as a good friend too. And it really has hurt my feelings over the years. It, and I, I've come close in anger to calling him out and, and saying, hey man, I don't talk about you. I, why are you putting these hurtful things? But every time that anger would rise up in me, it was like the Spirit just said, no, 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 no not right now. Not right now. I've, I've tried and not always succeeded to love my friend the way Jesus would have loved him. The way Jesus does love him. And I want so badly to, to win this man to Christ because he's so smart and, and he's so compassionate toward other people. I know that if he would find Jesus, he would be like another Apostle Paul. He would be one of the most uh, useful servants that, that the, the church has ever had. And so I pray about this. And then this summer, we're riding down the road, just the two of us, which never happens. And he starts to tell me how he had applied for a new job, which, which I had no idea about. And this job would put him in touch with a lot of religious organizations. I thought, oh, that's funny. Uh, I thought, well, you're probably not going to bring him Facebook posts up in your job interview, are you? Uh, but as we're going down the road, he said, since I'm in the car, and folks, please know that I'm not bragging on myself. He said, since I'm here in the car with my favorite Christian, why don't you tell me a, a little bit more about what you believe? Isn't that an honor, church? So here he is, a rabid atheist, if there ever was one. I didn't have to wedge my way in. I didn't have to hit him over the head. I didn't have to call him out on Facebook. He asked me. Just like Sergius Paulus does in the, in the 13th chapter of Acts. You don't have to force it on him. When the Holy Spirit does its work, they'll ask you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And you know, until we started having this conversation, it wasn't until then that I realized how little he actually knew about Christianity. Even though he had spoken so fiercely against it, he was hung up on this idea that a lot of people have, people in church too, but this idea that, that the God of, of Christianity is, a, is, a, is a, a, an angry and a judgmental God ready to strike sinners down at the first mistake. How it seemed like only perfect people were going to be welcomed by the church. As we talked, you know, I didn't feel like that young teenager full of anxiety. The Spirit started welling up and... I've never experienced anything like this. It was like the God, it was the, it was like I wasn't I don't want to say I wasn't in control but it was like I didn't even have to think about it. It's like the gospel, everything that I'd ever read and studied started pouring out of my mouth as we talked and only half realizing what I was doing I began to tell him a story of, from the 10th chapter of Acts. I'm going to read. I paraphrased it for him, but I'm going to read this morning. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? 
And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and call, one, call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodged with one Simon the, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein was all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have not eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, thou shalt not call common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into this house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied them. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful, an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Amen. Peter goes on to say, Of a truth, I perceive God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation that feareth Him and worketh righteousness is accepted by Him. I told my friend how it's not actions, it's not keeping a set of rules that makes us clean. It's Jesus' righteousness imputed toward us that makes us clean. Amen. And when God declares us clean, nobody, not preachers, not churches, has the right. When God has made us clean, nobody gets to tell us that we are unclean. Amen. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, if God has made you clean, you are as clean and worthy to enter into His presence as anybody else. As I was studying this lesson, though, I thought on that story that I told my friend. And here's another story in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit clears the way so a servant of God can do the work. The Spirit dealt with Cornelius, prepared his heart so that when Peter showed up, you, you can read on about how many people were saved through the message that Peter ended up preaching. But in this story, it's not just the hearer 
the recipient that gets worked on. It's the speaker too. Yes, you're right. The Holy Spirit made Peter look at his own prejudices, his own superiority complex, his own racism, because that's exactly what it was, and says, Peter, you do not get to decide who gets to hear the gospel. Right. It's the Holy Spirit yeah. that determines yeah. that. So this was a lesson for me too. I realized that I don't need to just be praying that the Holy Spirit will go before me and work on my loved ones so that when I get my opportunity to tell them about the gospel, they'll be ready for it. I need to be asking the Holy Spirit to work on me too so that when that moment arises, I'll be ready to... to Deliver the gospel that I will have internalized that good news so deeply in my heart that it'll just come pouring out. No doubt there are people in your life that you want to win to Christ. No doubt you have difficulty talking to those people. I understand that. Your words seem to come up short. But what the Bible teaches us again and again and again is that we have to work with the Spirit and through the Spirit if we want to see our loved ones saved. Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, this is Luke again, when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates, and I wonder if Luke remembered this when he was writing about Sergius Paulus, unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. Amen. Just like that story in, in Acts chapter 13, it's the Holy Ghost that's the operator here. We're just the tools. The Holy Ghost is, is doing the work. And just like Paul and Barnabas, just like Philip and the eunuch, just like Peter and Cornelius, we need to make sure that we're well acquainted with the Holy Spirit before that hour arises, before that opportunity comes. So that when it's our time, to do our work, when it's our time to speak our part, we'll have the Word of God internalized. We'll have a relationship with the Spirit. We'll know the Spirit. When the harvest time comes, we'll be able to put the bow on the package that God has already wrapped. Yeah. Amen. Questions, right? Not just praying for our loved ones, but praying for ourselves. That's how we're going to win people to Jesus. Not through our swelling words. Isn't that what Paul said? I came not with swelling words. I came not with fancy speech. I didn't come as a great orator. Demonstration. I just showed you Jesus. And that's what's going to make a difference. Show them Jesus and pray that the Holy Spirit will clear the way. Zach, tell the church what at the end of you and your buddy's conversation. <laughs> well, then, I think I gave him more than he anticipated. Because after I told him about Cornelius, he said, well, what about the Old Testament where, you know, God commands people to be killed for seemingly, I mean, you, if you lived under the Old Testament, you could get stoned to death for talking back to your parents. I mean, for real. It's in there. He said, well, what, about, what kind of God would do that? Said, Let me tell you something. He said, one time Jesus was in a place and these religious folks had caught a woman in the very act of adultery. I've often wondered how they caught her in the very act of adultery. You know what I mean? But they did, and they had witnesses. And they brought her to Jesus and they knew that they had him trapped. They said, Moses, the law of Moses says that this woman should be stoned to death. What say you? And they knew that if Jesus were to go against what Moses said, he would be a blasphemer. And they could kill him too for blasphemy. I love Jesus. Didn't he kind of... I mean, could you have invented Sherlock Holmes ain't got nothing on Jesus. Amen. You know what I mean? Could you have invented a, a more brilliant, compassionate person? Amen. Jesus says, okay, you're right. You're absolutely right. Moses says, we need to stop. So here's what we're going to do. 
We're going to stone her. But I'm going to recognize the, those that are worthy here today. He says, ye who are without sin, you're going to get to cast the first stone. <laughs> Here's what I love about Jesus. He could have stood there because Jesus knew he was without sin. He was the only one there worthy to throw a rock at. You're right. He could have stood there and looked each and every one of them dead in the eye. Come on, Zach. He knew. We read in the Gospels, he knew the content of yeah, men's he hearts. Yes, he, he could have looked each and every one of them in the eye and, and looked at them as they realized their own unworthiness. He doesn't do that. No. He turns around and kneels down and starts drawing in the dirt. I didn't tell my friend this, but let me tell you what. I've often thought people wonder what Jesus wrote in the dirt. Do you realize that the finger of God is what inscribed the law on those stone tablets? Do you know what dirt is? Just crushed up rocks. Jesus kneels down and draws in the dirt with the same finger that inscribed the law on Mount Sinai. Amen. Come on, sir. And when he gets up, Woman, my accusers are gone. Uh -uh. Neither do I keep. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Go and sin no more. Yeah. And my friend knew this much about Christianity. He said, but Jesus was without sin. I said, yep. He was the only one there who, had, who was worthy to kill her. And he said, neither do I keep. Amen. Hey, Go and sin no more. Hey, yeah, Instead of killing her, he forgave her. Yes. And he said, Wow. <laughs> I said, Yeah, what a guy. <laughs> Jesus is unlike anybody else in the whole world. Yes. And I'm convinced that the gospel is irresistible if people just have an experience with it. I haven't seen my friend saved yet. He's still posting that junk on Facebook. It seems less frequent than it used to be, but he still does it. But I'm still going to love him. Uh -huh. Because God loved me a long yeah. time yeah. before I came to him. Lord. And I just hope I can show my friend that same love. Bless you, God. Love of Jesus will change your life forever. Amen. Oh yeah. God. I'm glad I found it. Oh yeah. It's amazing. Bless you,